Mordecai got my whole story over lunch, so he knows that I, I actually started at NYU to study tech theater, so I was in Tisch originally. And, and then I took a physics one class by David Hogg a long, long time ago. And anyway, I decided I wanted to do what, what that guy did, and now, now we're here. So you can either blame him or thank him, I guess, depending on how this goes. And theater is much poorer for him. <laughs> exactly, yes. Think of what they're missing. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I, I thought I'd start by sort of setting the context for today, since I'm giving two talks, one talk here and then one talk at, at NYU. And uh, this is kind of a demonstration of what happens when you write a talk abstract a little bit too far in advance, because since writing my abstract, I actually scoped out a little bit. And so today I thought I would give you really the, the big picture view of how we're starting to use these, these objects, these stellar streams, to uncover the history, the evolution of the Milky Way, and to start to map out the dark matter distribution in the Milky Way as well. Tomorrow, on the other hand, I'm going to be much more focused. I'm going to talk about one particular stream, the detailed modeling that we've done of that stream, and what that has taught us about the nature of dark matter. So today is going to be much more of a big picture. This is supposed to be an informal talk, so I thought it could be conversational, and we could have some, some discussion if you have questions along the way. Uh, but I, before talking about all of that, I want to briefly just mention that there's many other things that I work on as well, and some of them with many of you in the room. So for example, I recently talked about the work that we're doing related to uh, discovering and characterizing binary star systems using the, the Apogee survey. So we're finding large numbers of binary stars using the uh, radial velocity method throughout a huge portion of the Milky Way. We found some interesting things like compact object companion candidates that are non-interacting. And we're, we're starting to think about how to use those to understand the sort of progenitors to what are now the, the LIGO events. I also give a, a talk in the fall at one of the lunch talks about the work that I'm doing related to galactic accretion. So on uh, some discoveries we've had related to stars that are forming in the Magellanic Stream as the, the large and small Magellanic Cloud are, are merging with the Milky Way. But today I'm really going to focus on this, this sort of third topic uh, about dark matter, about galactic archaeology, and, and try to give you the big picture view of where I see research going in the next 10 years or so. So uh, I want to focus on this question of, of how we can use the Milky Way and th these words that you may have heard, like galactic archaeology and near-field cosmology, to try to understand and, and probe fundamental physics. And I think um, in, in this context, there's sort of three goals that I, that I think are the core pillars of these two ideas that I want to try to approach. So the first is to, to map the dark matter distribution around the Milky Way in extreme detail. And so by that, I mean really try to test some of the predictions that have been around in, in simulations for a long time, like the, the density profile or the mass profile of the, the global dark matter distribution around the Milky Way, but also other sort of low order properties of the, the dark matter, like the shape or the triaxiality on large scales. By uh, detecting and, and characterizing dark matter, I, dark, dark matter substructure, I really mean trying to find very low mass things. So, substructure that is below the mass of the dwarf galaxies that we see, which if we could find a large population of these things would place constraints on the types of sort of effective models for dark matter that, that don't produce those things. And then the third thing is, is how we can use streams to sort of infer or understand the merger history of the Milky Way. And, and here I'm thinking sort of in, in, in discrete events, like the, the number of mergers per unit time, per unit mass ratio, which is something that evolves with redshift and depends on, on the mass of the Milky Way and, and other things. But this is also something that's beginning to be predicted somewhat robustly from, from large galaxy formation and cosmological simulations. So this is something we can also hope to try to uncover in the Milky Way using all of the stellar kinematic and, and chemical information that we have for a, a large number of stars. So I'll go, go into a bit more detail about each one of these things a bit later. But I, I really want to talk about how we can make progress on all of these goals using one particular type of tracer that I, I love. Uh, and those are stellar streams. So you saw the, the moving version of this earlier, but I want to start by talking about what stellar streams are and, and how they're so useful. So here's a, a map of the, the Milky Way halo. So I'm showing here uh, blue things are, are things that are closer. Green things are sort of intermediate distances. Red are much farther away. Uh, this is some recent work that I've been doing with a, a grad student at Chicago who was actually visiting here last week, Nora Ship. So there's lots of interesting substructure here. Uh, to give you uh, an idea of the, the demographics of the streams that we know about, and by streams I'm talking about you know, things like the things that I'm tracing out for you, in case you're not used to looking at all of these, these images all the time. To give you an idea of the demographics, there's about 60 streams that, that we think are, are candidate uh, disrupted objects around the Milky Way. 
And about 15 of those are close enough or dense enough uh, that they've been well studied. So they've been followed up. We have spectra, et cetera. These are just some of my, my favorites that I've traced out here for you. So you can see there's a number of ones in the southern sky. This is from the Dark Energy Survey. Um, there's, there's fewer, but there's this very prominent one in the northern sky. This is from the, the um, pre-imaging for the, the DESI survey. But these, all of these objects, we think, are the remnants of tidally disrupted dwarf galaxies and, and globular clusters that have fallen into the Milky Way and are, are now in the process of merging. So there's obviously a number of different ways we can, we can view the sky when we have data for, for everything. So for example, here's that, that same map of the Milky Way halo, but now rotated to align with the, roughly the orbital plane of the, the most massive stream that we know of. And that's the, the Sagittarius stream. So that actually connects back to the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which is behind the disk right here. So it wasn't covered by these surveys. But uh, this is a, a, a large dwarf that's disrupting, and you can trace the tails all the way, basically around the entire sky and a little bit farther. There's also, this is now looking at the, the Galactic Anticenter, there's also things in this map that aren't actually streams the way that I've defined it, tidally disrupted dwarf galaxies or globular clusters. Especially if you look towards the, the outer parts of the Milky Way disk. So there's all this blue, which means close structure that looks like feathery features arcing over the outer parts of the disk. These we think are actually tidal perturbations to the outer parts of the Milky Way from the satellite galaxies. But this is actually material that once originated in the disk and has now been kicked five to 10 kiloparsecs away from the disk plane. So there's some pretty substantial perturbations to the outer parts of the Milky Way disk. So making maps like this can help us find streams, but also reveal some of this other interesting structure. So I can stare at those visualizations all day, and I do often just look at those visualizations <laughs> quite a bit. But uh, I want to get back to the goals that I laid out earlier. So the question is, how can streams help with each of these things? So it was realized pretty early on by David and, and Catherine and many other people that uh, streams nearly trace orbits. And so they provide a lot of information about the underlying mass distribution in the Milky Way. So they can almost directly help us with this question or this goal. They're also extremely kinematically cold. So if you have a passing substructure or a subhalo, the impulse that it imparts on a stream will, be, like, pr will leave a record in the stream in the density distribution that we can then see later on. So they're one of the only ways that we have to, to study the really low mass end of the dark matter uh, mass spectrum. They're also, if they're, a rec they're, they're disrupted dwarf galaxies and globular clusters, they're literally just a record of earlier epochs of accretion onto the Milky Way. So you can see how they connect to the sort of merger history of our galaxy. And one of the reasons that they're, they're so informative and so useful is that we, we think we understand the dynamics of how streams form really precisely. So I'm just showing an n-body simulation here of a globular cluster mass thing orbiting around a very toy Milky Way. So this is looking in the rotating frame, and this is looking in the, the, um, the frame of the Milky Way, essentially. So from an observed stream, like if we stopped this and looked at a bunch of stars here, we can estimate its intrinsic properties, like the, the age or the mass of the stream. We can, uh, uh, from the track of the stream, we get information about the orbit of the progenitor, which is not something we typically get access to in, in galactic dynamics. And we also have a few examples of streams like Sarah's favorite here, PAL5 that uh, connect back to the progenitor system. So this is Palomar 5, which is kind of the prototypical globular cluster stream, where you can see the tails here connect back to Palomar 5, the cluster. So this helps us sort of calibrate our understanding of how, how these things form and, and how uh, different objects disrupt. So interestingly, if you just take the, the proper motion of the cluster and the distance and, and the other kinematic properties we have of the cluster, and you just numerically integrate an orbit in a toy model of the Milky Way, and then plot that on the sky here, as we, we sort of alluded to before, the tails here, the trailing tail and the leading tail, neatly almost delineate what that orbit of the, the cluster is without ever having to, to know anything about the cluster or the tails. So now I'm going to focus on each of those goals and go into a bit more detail. I'm going to focus more on, on, on this topic, but I'm going to touch on the other two as well, on substructure and, and the accretion history. So as I alluded to earlier, I think one of the, the main drivers of galactic dynamics, at least with a, a capital G here, is to measure the sort of global shape and, and properties of the Milky Way's dark matter distribution. So is the density profile NFW? Are the outskirts, like beyond a tenth of the burial radius, are the outskirts of the Milky Way's halo triaxial? Or is it more spherical? So these are kind of second order predictions from simulations, but they're things that, that we can actually check in the Milky Way. And so we, we should do that. <clears throat> The obvious challenge here is that 
we want to measure something like the density of dark matter on, on large scales, but we don't actually observe the dark matter, hence its name. We observe you know, the luminous things, the stars, uh, the, the gas, et cetera. So then from these surveys like Apogee and Gaia and et cetera, we do have access to kinematic information, like the position and the velocity for a large number of stars. And especially over the next few years, we'll have that information for hundreds of millions of stars. So a pretty big sample. This doesn't immediately tell us the dark matter density, but these stars are orbiting in the acceleration field that's sourced by the density. So if we can use the kinematics here to learn the acceleration field, that is enough to get us back to the density, and then we're all happy. Now, the, the challenge here, though, is that at best, what we have is something like the instantaneous tracer phase space distribution function. That's a very fancy way of just saying we have positions and velocities of stars today and today only. We just have a kinematic snapshot of the Milky Way. And we want to use that to learn about this acceleration field. So there's, there's actually no necessary connection between these two things. We could just be observing the Milky Way at a really special time when all of the stars happen to be configured in the state that they're in now. And if we looked again in a billion years, it would just fly apart again. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do any inference, right? Uh, so one solution to this problem is to use something like genes modeling, where you, you make very strong assumptions about the Milky Way, like the symmetry properties or the equilibrium state. And you may painfully remember many chapters in Vinny and Tremaine devoted to, to this topic. But we know that actually all of the assumptions that, that we use to, to go into methods like this are, are violated in the Milky Way. We know that uh, the, the symmetry, we don't know actually what the symmetry properties of the Milky Way are. We see signatures of disequilibrium that I'll talk about later. And so these, these types of assumptions will then bias the inferences that we make. Now, the problem would be a lot easier if instead of instantaneous phase space positions, we had actual full orbits for stars or even segments of orbits. So if we had orbit segments, we could actually directly measure the acceleration. If you have an orbital trajectory, you know the acceleration local to that orbit. And that, for example, is how Newton determined that the force law of the solar system falls off like 1 over r squared. He saw that the orbits of the planets are closed to ellips ellipses that connect back on themselves. It would be a lot harder if you just had the positions and velocities for all the planets at one instant in time and then had to try to learn about what the, the solar force field is. So if we had orbits or orbit segments, this would require many fewer assumptions. So then the question is, how do we see orbits? And that's where streams re-enter the picture. So as I mentioned before, from a single snapshot of the kinematics of the stream, we get information about the orbit that the progenitor system is on. But there's actually quite a bit more information in the stream. And that's because the stars in a stream are all small devi on different orbits that are slight deviations away from the orbit of the progenitor system. So what that means is if we observed a bunch of stars in a stream today and we got their positions and velocities, if we integrated their orbits backwards in time in a bunch of trial different distributions of mass, if we got that distribution correct, like if we got the model of the Milky Way correct, all of those small deviated orbits should vacuum back into the, the progenitor system. So I'm looking at these simulations in the rotating frame, so things look a little crazy. But here in the correct model for the Milky Way, they suck back into the progenitor, and over here, Crazy things happen. Yeah. And that's robust to numerical issues. Like, what do you mean by numerical well, issues? Well, the gravitational systems are chaotic, right? So mm -hmm. if you get your, your starting snapshot slightly wrong and run it backwards, you don't Agreed. end up at we're in We're in toy world right now. OK. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, this is a cute idea. And so, so we use this sticking in the, in the toy assumption. We'll come, I'll come back to exactly that point, though, later on. Sticking in this, this uh, toy model of the Milky Way that we're, that we're thinking about, it, it's even not that, that nice, because we never actually observe the positions and velocities of stars infinitely precisely. There's always finite observational errors on the quantities. Um, and something weird happens, because we actually observe a heliocentric spherical transformation of the true positions and the velocities of the stars that also involves the motion of the sun around the Milky Way. So things are a bit more complex. We often also have missing dimensions here. So it's not like we can just take the, the, all of the, the stars that we see in a stream and numerically integrate their orbits backwards, because we often don't have a distance or have a very poorly constrained distance. But that's totally fine from the perspective of, of a generative model. So if we knew the true position and, and the velocity of a star, and we knew the, the solar motion and position, we could evaluate the likelihood, because we have good likelihood information from surveys like Gaia and Apogee, and et cetera. So we could just absorb the, the position and the velocity of every star in a stream into our probabilistic model as latent variables that we 
also need to infer along with the, the rest of the properties that we care about, like the acceleration field sourced by the dark matter, uh, the, the progenitor orbit, uh, but also things like the, the mass loss history of the progenitor. So if we knew the orbit of the progenitor system, and we knew the time that each star in a stream was stripped out of the progenitor, then uh, basically we can get their position, their true position and velocity today just by evolving them under this acceleration field, and that gives us a clear path to being able to evaluate this likelihood. So generically, you have to model all of these different things that are in the, the white background circles all together. So that's a lot of, a lot of parameters to cope with. This model has a, a few nice properties. I think the, the most, uh, most promising aspect of it is that you can put anything you want into this acceleration field. So it doesn't just have to be a toy model for the Milky Way, although I'm going to demonstrate a test using a toy model of the Milky Way. But this could be something complex and, and time evolving even if we wanted to, and we'll, we'll see later on why that's going to be important. But one of the, the not so nice properties of this model is, is all of these latent parameters that are in the model. So because we don't you know, we need to be able to map from the true position and velocity to the data that we have today. We need to add in the 3D position and the 3D velocity for each star into the model, along with the time that it's stripped, which connects back to the mass loss history. So computationally, this is a little, a little bit of a challenge. But we've tested this uh, on some simulations that we've run of, of the Sagittarius stream. So that this is the, the final snapshot of an n-body simulation of Sagittarius that I'm showing here just to test the waters and on doing this kind of inference to see how, precise, how precisely we can measure the parameters of the model that we use to run the simulation. So we also, so we run the simulation, we then mock observe some stars, assuming Gaia-like proper motion uncertainties and that we can measure their distances. And we assume that we also have some independent measurements of the, the progenitor system today. So we know the position and the velocity of the progenitor system because we need to integrate the orbit of this thing along with the, the, the orbits of the, the stars that are actually in the stream. So then once we have those mock observations, we can run the, the, uh, met the model that I showed you before and try to look, see if we recover what we used to run the simulation. One caveat here is that I put four crosses here because we did this with very few numbers of stars. And the reason is exactly that factor of seven, the number of latent parameters that we have to cope with when we're, when we're trying to do this kind of inference. So the, the, the number of parameters scales like seven times the number of stars that we want to use in order to learn the, the, the properties of the dark matter. So we just stuck with n equals four, which is already a lot of parameters here. But still, uh, the, the results from doing this kind of test are, are pretty promising. So just four stars in a stream that we measure with Gaia-like uncertainties, and we have good distances to, we can recover the, the input circular velocity of the halo and, and something about the shape as well. So here we have we, we ran this in a, in a prolate dark matter distribution. So we can recover that using, using just these four stars. Now that was, that was four stars. Typically we have hundreds of stars, or at least tens of stars in the stream. So extending this to real data is going to be, but it at least has, has pretty promising constraining power, given that this is just using four stars, right? OK, so now getting back to Sigurd's point, which is, that was all kind of a joke in a way, because it was all done in an extremely naive representation of the Milky Way, where it's a static, time-independent galaxy. It's a you know fixed mass profile, dark matter distribution, etc. Did you just call the entire field of classical dynamics a joke? Yes. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> no, I, I called what I did a joke, um, which maybe you shouldn't do in a job talk, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, the reason it's a joke, though, is that now we know the Milky Way is extremely dynamic, essentially on all scales. So in the disk, for example, you, you can look at the vertical kinematics of the stars in the really local solar neighborhood. And this is something that uh, Soror Gandhi, who's a grad student at, at NYU, is working on, actually, with, with a group of us here. And you can see unmixed perturbations from satellite galaxies just in the local velocity distribution around the sun. So even at 8 kiloparsecs into the disk, we see perturbations from, from satellites, mostly. So this immediately will bias what you may have learned as the Oort problem, trying to determine the dark matter density local to the sun using these vertical kinematics. But as I showed you before, we also see these distortions in the very outer parts of the disk. So it's not just near the sun. It's very far out into the disk as well, almost into the halo. So if, if you're perturbing the, the outer parts of the disk 5 or 10 kiloparsecs away, away from the disk midplane, that's no longer a disk. That's some crazy you know, wobbly thing in the out, outer parts of the Milky Way disk. So this will immediately make determining the rotation curve out beyond 12 or 15 kiloparsecs much, much more difficult and kind of meaningless in a way. 
So the inner Milky Way, and here inner, I'm really, I, I mean where the disk is, the inner Milky Way is very dynamic. And so that already suggests that the, the toy picture of the Milky Way that I showed you before, static, simple mass profile, that's kind of out the window. That was all for the disk. What about in the halo? We also actually see pretty strong evidence for time dependence and, and disequilibrium far out into the Milky Way's halo. And I think the strongest case for that comes from this blip right here, which is called the Orphan Stream, which was uh, discovered in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so about 15 years ago or so. It, we think it's a, the remnant of a dwarf galaxy that, that's now, we just see the stream that's left over. Uh, it's pretty massive, so I think the original stellar mass of this thing had to be about 10 to the 7 solar masses or so. And it's called Orphan because there's no known progenitor system for it. It looks like it's just the stream that's left over. So once Gaia uh, DR2 came out, we uh, so the original part of the stream was only traced to the bottom of the, the northern footprint here. Once Gaia DR2 came out, we, we searched for more, more stars that could be members of the stream. And we found these, these RR Lyrae type uh, pulsating variable stars that are typical to, to dwarf galaxy, you know, old metal core solar populations. We found these RR Lyrae in the stream that act, essentially extend the stream pretty far into the southern hemisphere and almost wrap around the whole sky. These uh, horizontal branch stars are nice because they're, they're essentially standard candles. They're like sepias. They pulse with, with a predictable period that scales with the luminosity. And so we get very accurate distances to all of these individual stars in the stream. So you can, you can make images like this, where you instead transform the, the sky position and distance to each star in the stream into Cartesian coordinates. And you don't see that the stream just blows up entirely. That's because the, the distance precision is so good to these individual stars that you can res essentially resolve the thickness of the stream. So the key thing that we found with, with Orphan, this was the, the known, yeah, this was the known part of the Orphan stream up here. We extended it quite far into the, the, um, the southern part of the galactic hemisphere. Uh, and we found that the stream is actually about 100 kiloparsecs in length. So you can, you can go to this visualization here if you have your laptop out and, and see an interactive version of this. But the point is that the stream is now essentially going through the disk all the way out into the, the galactic halo, both in the southern galactic hemisphere and the northern galactic hemisphere. So that'll be important in a second. So we can take the same RLI ray stars that we now know are part, part of the stream, and we can start to look at their kinematics. So now instead of looking in Cartesian coordinates, I'm back to spherical coordinates. But in a coordinate system that's roughly aligned with the elongation direction of the stream. So this is like longitude along the stream and then latitude away from it. For a typical stream, the proper motions or the velocities of the stars in the stream on average point along the stream. So we expected that once we looked at the proper motions of these stars, they should point in this direction uniformly across the whole part of the stream. Now I'm plotting the, the proper motion vectors here of little segments of the stream, so averaging over small angular subsections of the stream. Interestingly, there's this, there's this deviation here towards the center. So this is at the point where it's closest to, to us right now and then uh, over here, the, the, the proper motions point along the stream again. So it looks like some kind of external perturbation gave these stars in the middle part of the stream some extra velocity perpendicular to the stream. And this won't survive for very long. So if you, if you wait another orbit around the galaxy, the stream will no longer look like a stream because you, you need to be elongating in the direction of the stream in order to stay coherent. So one question then is, is what could have caused this, this perturbation? Well, it turns out it, the, the orphan stream is so long that it actually intersects the orbital plane of the Large Magellanic Cloud. The Large Magellanic Cloud is, is this very massive dwarf galaxy pair, actually, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, that are on their first infall into the Milky Way. And we think that actually the, the LMC had a direct effect on the, the stream and caused this velocity offset in the center part. Hey, so, can you point out where that offset is in the in the figure with the LMC on it. Oh, with the LMC. Sorry, I couldn't quite. The... <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> hey Siri. Uh, it's this part here. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So it's it's actually just a little bit beyond. If you trace the orbits backwards, this is the part that was closest to the LMC sure. in the past, and now they're they're slightly forward. So if you then try to model the track of the, the stars that we see and, and sky position and proper motion, and, and we even have some radial velocities for some of these stars, the only way you can explain the, the deviation in the, the track of proper motions and the, some strangeness in the sky positions is if you include a very massive LMC. 
typical to the masses that other people are finding now, that it's basically a comparable to the enclosed mass of the Milky Way at the radius that it's at right now in the Milky Way halo. So while I showed that, that streams can in principle deliver very precise constraints on the dark matter distribution, at least in the context of the, the toy models that I showed before, uh, I, you know, that, that was all a, a joke in the sense that, that we know things are much more complex. We see time dependence in the inner parts of the galaxy. We see uh, perturbations from satellites in the outer part of the galaxy. So if we want to try to, uh, to actually make progress on this, we really need to face up to including time dependence and non-equilibrium structures into the modeling that we're doing. So in the past modeling streams, a lot of people kind of fit these toy models. Like you can go to chapter three in Binion and Tremaine and read out uh, different potential models. They try to fit those to the Milky Way and hope that those were, were telling us actually robust measures of the summary properties that, that we want to measure, like the, the mass profile and the flattening. But I think the way, the way we're going to go forward is to instead fit these toy models so we can get out those simple numbers, but with flexible deviations that allow us to absorb uh, and simultaneously constrain the, the complex, complexity around those models. So that's a very vague statement. And uh, there's, there's, I said that like there's an obvious uh, path for what to do there. But there actually hasn't been very much work on, on, on doing this in the, in the modeling perspective. So I've been thinking about uh, one possible path that I think is, is a really nice connection between the galaxy formation group here, the dynamics group, and the, and the data group. So I'm going to just lay out that plan. And it's something that we can discuss later if people are interested. So first, uh, we have pretty good models now for, for how dark matter halos grow and evolve. So we have, have cosmological simulations, and we have a lot of them. And those essentially predict the typical growth histories and time dependence that we expect to see in, in dark matter halos like the Milky Way. So we should be able to use all of these simulations that we have to, to somehow extract a compressed representation of, of this kind of evolution, both spatially and in time. So for a Milky Way mass halo, I should be able to say, what's the typical uh, spatial and, and time evolution of the dark matter halo. So I'm imagining something like a basis function exp expansion that you would do for the density field, but now where you've also included time as another dimension that you're expanding around. And that's sort of new mathematical territory, but it's something that uh, Martin Weinberg's group, for example, has made some, some initial promising uh, progress on. <coughs> Uh, so anyway, if we, if we were able to extract these kind of compressed representations and, and very quickly evaluate uh, the state from, from these representations, we'd then be able to simultaneously just put these in with the toy models that we're trying to fit using something like the, the stream rewinding that I was showing before and get constraints simultaneously on this complex time evolution and on the summary properties. So I think there's a lot of great student and, and postdoc projects sort of in this space that make really good connections between the different groups here. So that was all uh, about the sort of first goal that I mentioned before, which is just mapping the dark matter distribution really globally. But now I want to just briefly mention the other two as well. So the second goal that I mentioned was detecting dark matter substructure using stellar streams. So it was also realized pretty early on uh, that not only do streams give you orbital information about, about orbits around the Milky Way, which is useful for constraining the sort of global distribution of dark matter, they're also extremely useful uh, as, as uh, tools for studying small-scale substructure as well. And as I mentioned before, that's because they're very kinematically cold. So they have velocity dispersions that are typically less than a kilometer per second. So if you have a passing subhalo that imparts a, a velocity kick on a small part of the stream that's of order a kilometer per second or larger, that will then imprint on the density evolution of the stream. So here's a sort of gallery of simulations of, of streams that have been perturbed by different configurations of subhalos. Uh, with a, a mass range from about 10 to the 5 to, to 10 to the 9 solar masses or so, just to show you the, the, the kinds of things that can happen to a stream evolved under, under a lambda CDM predicted dark matter only universe. So uh, this is very interesting because at these low masses, which have a direct effect on the evolution of streams, we don't have many, many other uh, uh, ways of studying the, the mass function down here. And as I mentioned before, this is really interesting because this is where you start to see deviations between cold dark matter and other dark matter theories, like fuzzy dark matter, warm dark matter, and et cetera. So I think this mass range, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 solar masses or so, is going to be one of the, the uh, most interesting ways we can use streams to try to constrain these effective models for dark matter. Now, what are the, the complications here? So tomorrow, I'm going to talk about that in a lot more gory detail. Today, I just want to flash a couple things that, that might be sticks in, in the side of that story. 
things that also can affect the density evolution of streams. So for example, with, with Sarah, we worked on what the galactic bar, the time-dependent galactic bar at the center of the Milky Way, what that can do to streams as they, they orbit through the disk and come close to the, the center of the galaxy. So with Cal5, for example, this is the stream I showed you before. Here's the cluster. This is the trailing tail. This is the leading tail. We knew something funny was going on with this stream, because if you just look at the, the leading tail and compare it to the trailing tail, it's about half as long, and it's about half of the density of the densest part of the trailing part of the stream. And if you just run a, a simulation, an n-body simulation of a, of a disrupting globular cluster like Palomar 5, you don't generically get these kinds of asymmetries if you use a very toy model for the Milky Way, like a static, time-independent model. So we, we then sort of repeated those simulations, but just included one extra component, which is a time-dependent, rotating galactic bar model. And if you do that, these, these types of asymmetries are, are a natural outcome of, of that kind of simulation. Essentially because different parts of the stream, as the stream is passing through the, the galactic disk, will see the bar at different phase angles. And that imparts a different torque than on different parts of the stream. So that can have the same effect that a, sub, a large subhalo uh, would have on a stream, and that it can, cause, it can cause a velocity kick to stars that makes them then later on evolve in their density. So we think that these kinds of asymmetries that we're seeing in Hal 5 can actually be explained from perturbations from the, the galactic bar. But there's other more boring or baryonic effects that can also imprint themselves on streams. So theoretically, this has not been observed yet, but theoretically, giant molecular clouds can also have an impact on streams. So if you, again, with, with PAL5, which is passing through the, the midplane of the disk at about uh, seven kiloparsecs or so radially from the center of the galaxy, there's a lot of substructure there in the distribution of gas in the Milky Way's disk. Those can actually do the same thing that subhalos do. The one difference is that they're slightly lower density, so they don't have as dramatic of an effect, but they can still cause density perturbations along, along the streams. Another thing that can happen is what I showed you before with Orphan. So you can have other uh, large satellite galaxies of the Milky Way that come close to some of the streams and leave more large-scale distortions to the streams that may evolve into more co complex morphologies later on. So that was with, with Orphan and the LMC. But we actually think that this is some new work that, that I've been working on. PAL-5 actually comes pretty close to the Sagittarius galaxy itself. So we think that this might also be a contributor to the, the funky morphology that we see for PAL-5. So PAL-5 has really had a, a rough life. It's actually really surprising that it's such a neat, coherent thing today. It makes you wonder uh, what's hiding behind all of this noise, whether there's lots of perturbed substructure away from the stream. So while streams are, are a very promising avenue for trying to constrain the, the low mass end of, of the dark matter subhalo population, we're beginning to see that there's many other uh, complex processes in, the, the, in a real galaxy that can actually also imprint on the density evolution of these streams. So I think we need to do much more realistic simulations beyond just inserting a rotating galactic bar model into a you know, static time-independent Milky Way, time-independent Milky Way, in order to really understand how, how much these things matter and, and on what scales, so that if we see density variations in a stream, we can uniquely map that back to constraints on, on dark matter. OK. Finally, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is, is how we can try to study the accretion history or the merger history of the Milky Way. So again, uh, this is in the context of thinking about individual merger events with the Milky Way as a function of time, for example, uh, which is a, a thing that, that you can extract from, from some of these large galaxy formation simulations. So if we want to measure the merger rate in the Milky Way, one obvious thing to do is to just look at all the dwarf galaxies that we have and try to reconstruct what their orbits are, and then see when they fell in, and then maybe that will tell you the, the merger rate. But many of these satellites are not actually disrupting at all yet. They don't show any signs of tidal debris or, or tidal, extra tidal debris. So the, if they are tracing the merger history, they're really just tracing the, tracing the tail of the, the orbit infall distribution of things that don't disrupt. So it's related to the merger history, but it's not a direct uh, uh, trace back to that. On the other end of the spectrum, instead of looking at the bound things, you could instead try digging around in the, the trash heap that is the, the stellar halo. And that's something that people have been really starting to do uh, within the last two years or so, using primarily data from, from the Gaia mission, and, and again, these large spectroscopic surveys like Apogee, which give us chemical information. So the, the, the emerging picture from studying the bulk distribution of the, the stellar halo around the Milky Way 
So we now think that most of the solar halo was contributed by very few sort of one to 10 ish mergers very long time ago. So by, by total mass, we think most of the solar halo is just from one or two large mergers a very long time ago. But by number, if we want to try to reconstruct the, the dn dt d, d mu, by number, we expect many more smaller mergers over that same amount of time. And the question is, uh, how can we pick those out over the, the bulk of the mass, which was contributed by very few mergers? So we're starting to be able to do this by, in, by combining both dynamics and chemistry. So for example, if you look in the space of energy and, and angular momentum for a, a bunch of stars, and you also cluster on chemical properties like the, the metallicities of stars, you can start to pick out other merger, smaller merger events. So this was from a paper by Helmer Koppelman uh, last year where we identified two more um, clusters essentially in by combining dynamics and their chemical properties. And they're called damnos one and two. Anyway, there's not a lot of good names for the, the things that, that we know of that formed the Milky Way halo. In any case, uh, these two things, satellite galaxies and, and the, the bulk, like smooth stellar halo, they clearly contain a lot of information about this quantity, the accretion, the accretion rate onto the Milky Way as a function of, of time. The stellar streams, though, are really the, the missing connection between these two things, because they're the future state of the satellite galaxies that we see that are bound today. And they're sort of the less mixed versions of the things that emerged with the, the Milky Way a long time ago and are now much smoother and distributed throughout the whole stellar halo. So how can we use the stellar streams in order to try to combine all of these things to measure this quantity? To make this connection, uh, there's a few key ingredients that we need. So we need models for the infall rate, the infall orbits, and, and the mass function for all of the, the things that we know are merging with the Milky Way. And we have models of those from, from cosmological simulations that so people have been able to extract these, these types of distributions from, from galaxy formation simulations. Uh, on the observational side, we also need to be able to measure our survey selection function. So we need to be able to say, in a given part of the sky, uh, how deep can we see? And can we see, would we be able to see see a stream if it were there. So this, this type of thing, the survey selection function, which is really just based on how, how deep you can go, how, what's your photon noise limit essentially in a, in a given part of the sky. These two things we have a pretty good handle on how to do right now. But there's sort of two missing ingredients here. And the first one on the theory side is we need to be able to predict the density evolution and the morphology evolution of streams so we know when they fall out of our, our threshold of detectability. And we, we can do this in sort of Again, toy models for the Milky Way, where we know that roughly the density of, of a stream will fall off like a power law with time, usually like time to the, the third power. Uh, but we don't know how to do this in the presence of all of the other complex things that are going on in the Milky Way, like the subhalos, like the bar, giant molecular clouds, etc. So we need to be able to develop this kind of robust simulation of stream densities in order to invert the population of streams into a, <clears throat> an accretion rate. <clears throat> My voice is losing, it's going away. Um, the last thing on the, the observational side, so the selection function tells us, could we see a stream in a given part of the sky? But there's another piece of the puzzle, which is, did we see a stream in, in a part of the sky? And what's the detection efficiency of finding a given stream like that in that part of the sky? And the challenge here is that we don't actually have any really robust automated stream finding methods. So if you wanted to actually estimate this quantity right now, you'd have to put probes into <laughs> Very few people's brains, I'm totally losing my voice now. You'd have to put probes into a few people's brains and try to model their like pattern recognition cortexes in order to see whether they find the stream or not given a part of the sky. So again, we're, we're at this, this uh, crossroads where streams clearly encode information about the destruction rate of satellites, about the merger history of the galaxy, and they really provide this link between satellites and the, the diffuse stellar halo that we were able to study now with Gaia. But if we want to use the streams that we see in order to infer this thing, to do this inversion, we're missing these, these two key pieces, models of stream density evolution in more realistic environments and the survey detection efficiency. I actually have water up here. I just haven't been drinking it. Thank you, Drummond. <laughs> I drink it myself. <laughs> I might need it in a second. <laughs> these things, you're like talking all day, and then you're supposed to give a talk at the end of the day. It's crazy. Anyway. Uh, so I put in a pre-doc uh, project uh, specifically thinking about Nora Ship, who I was working on the mass of the stellar halo with before, because I think we can actually make progress on, on, on both of these things simultaneously. 
so we'll, there's lots of other opportunities here, but I'm, I'm really interested in, in pushing on survey detection efficiency and automated stream finding and on, on making these uh, more robust models of stream evolution. So in the last what, few minutes that I have, I want to briefly mention uh, what I see as sort of the future of stellar streams research, and at least as, as they connect back to the goals that I initially laid out. So if we go back to those goals, so we want to map the dark matter distribution in detail, we want to detect and find dark matter subhalos around the Milky Way, and we want to be able to infer the accretion history of our galaxy. One of the things that we've learned is that things are a lot more complex than, than we thought sort of 10 or 20 years ago. <coughs> so for example, there's uh, eminent time dependence and disequilibrium throughout the galaxy, both in the disk and out into the stellar halo. Um, in, the, in the context of detecting subhalos, we think that the, the densities of streams, or the density evolution of streams, is really contaminated if you want to try to find dark matter substructure by different galactic dynamical phenomena, like the galactic bar and, and, and other baryonic things. And finally, if you want to try to measure the galactic accretion history, we need to be able to, to simulate how streams evolve in much more realistic, dynamic environments, rather than the simple toy models for, for galaxies that we've been using for a long time. So in the next decade, I think, uh, we'll be able to deliver on, on a lot of these things, even, even in spite of this. So I think sort of in the next five to ten years, we will see more robust determinations of the Milky Way's mass profile, of the shape, and sort of first constraints on the time evolution and the growth of the Milky, <coughs> Milky Way's halo. We'll also start to see constraints on dark matter models, more effective dark matter models, I would say, like cold dark matter, warm dark matter. Uh, basically by detecting or, or placing limits on the very smallest mass end of the, the dark matter subhalo mass function. And I think we'll be able to do the, the first stream population or accretion, accretion history inferences by pushing on automated stream detection so we can measure our detection efficiency and uh, by, by improving the simulations we have. The reason I think we're going to be able to do this is because we know what's required in order to be able to do this. So we know the pieces that we're missing in order to make the, the measurements of the Milky Way's mass more robust. We know that uh, the different things that can, in principle, perturb the density evolution of streams. So we need to model those better, simulate those better, and, and essentially uh, be able to connect the, the density structures that we see back to the, the dark matter models uh, that produce subhalos that can perturb the streams. And then finally, uh, we know that we need to somehow determine our, our detection efficiencies from surveys whether that involves uh, doing surgery on people and modeling their brains, or whether we can actually do this more automatically using simulation or using machine learning, that's an open question. So the, the key points I want to drive home here are that stellar streams provide a really clear path towards precisely constraining the distribution and the nature of dark matter around the Milky Way. However, over the last 10 years or so, we've found that in all regards, things are much more complicated than we originally. However, I see that as an opportunity, because that means with careful modeling, we can study interesting dynamics, we can study the evolution of the galaxy, and we can place constraints on fundamental physics like dark matter. So I'll end there, and hopefully I won't have to talk again. <laughs> uh, we'll turn on the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. try just for fun to see how your rewinder would do with Gaia errors for a few stars in Sagittarius and if yes was it different because those should also be biased against the fact that they're not taking into account the time evolution right all the time. are you asking did, did I try it with data for Sagittarius or did I try it with yes. oh yeah I haven't done it with Sagittarius I did try it with Palomar 5 uh, the the challenge I immediately ran into is um, even at the precision that we have for distances to individual RL array in, in PAL5, it's still not good enough to be able to rewind in, you know, very precisely. Like, it, it, it quickly makes the likelihood very challenging to compute, and so I, I haven't actually done that. But in principle, as I was talking about really earlier, it should be doable. It just might take a lot of, a lot of time. Do you want to just choose questions? Okay. Uh, sure. Hi. 
Um, so I'm not sure if this question makes sense, but in the beginning you said that there are like 60 known streams. Yeah. Um, and for measuring these more like global properties that you were talking about in the beginning of your talk, um, how many streams would you like preferably like to have in order to, to get these things down to a level of, of error that yeah, that, that is a great question. So one person who's tried to tackle that is Anna Benatza, who looked at, again, in the context of very toy models of the Milky Way, how different pairs of streams that we see uh, contribute to like, improving the, the likelihood on different, quantity, different parameters that we have. But that was all in the context of we know the mass distribution, the model for the mass distribution, we just want to know the parameters. So you can do that kind of forecasting. It's kind of analogous to forecasting for CMB emissions. But I, personally, I don't think it's it, like that. That intuition won't map onto trying to understand the more complex things, like the time evolution and the dynamic parts of the Milky Way. So it, I think what she found, though, is uh, if you pick the right four streams, you can get sub percent constraints on parameters like the mass. But that's again with all those caveats. Okay, uh, Shirley, then Shirley. Um, oh, did you? It, what about me? <laughs> if Rachel was up before, you can raise her hand again. Sorry, Rachel and Shirley. So this is really cool, really beautiful work. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I've heard, though, that there are other galaxies besides the Milky Way. <laughs> so I was just wondering, in the context of thinking about um, upcoming new telescopes where we might be able to do resolved stellar population yeah. studies in other galaxies, what are the prospects for studying some of these things like the merger history, mm -hmm. the stellar halos, how diverse they are from galaxy to galaxy, some of those issues. I realize you won't have nearly as precise information, especially on the velocities, but have you, have you thought about that at all? Yeah, so I think there's there's two angles. One is uh, the question of what can you learn just from the, morpholo the projected morphologies yeah. of streams. Yeah. And uh, some people have, have, worked, have started to work on that. Uh, Sarah is interested in this, I know, as well. Uh, but it, it is an open question. If you, the question is, how many dimensions do you need, right. phase space right. dimensions do you need in order to measure something like the yeah. flattening of a halo? So if you're interested and you, in. And you might be able to get metallicities, right? Fair enough, yeah. 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 So I think on one side, it's unclear what kind of dynamical information just having a projected map of a stream gives you. On the other hand, if you are able to get metallicities and a radial velocity and, <laughs> and other things, can you still reconstruct the, the merger history, the accretion history, without being able to reconstruct yeah. the mass or something like that? And I think that there is a lot of uh, promising work being done on that by uh, David Hendel and, and other people, thinking in the context especially of W first. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, so, so you mentioned why this compressed dark matter halo so representation of the more realistic. So if you were going to make a wish list of how you get these compressed representation other than just run the whole simulation through, right? What would you want? The second sort of related question is like, what kind of stream features do you expect when you have these like blank, like weird dark matter candidates? Weird dark matter candidates. They're not uh, cold dark matter. Okay, yeah, so let's start with your first one. Uh, <laughs> Did you have a slide in mind? Ah, uh, perfect. Thank you. Now I'm thinking about your second question, so I've forgotten your first one. Let's start with your second question. So one of the interesting things is that, uh, and this is something I'll talk about tomorrow with everybody at NYU, there's kind of a disconnect right now between the way astronomers and, and people like people who are studying the halo, uh, the way we're thinking about dark, constraining dark matter and the way the particle physicists are thinking about it. So really, we can only, I can only speak to the sort of effective models of dark matter for which I can simulate something, some aspect of it, like cold dark matter, uh, warm dark matter. Now people are, are actually doing this for fuzzy dark matter, et cetera. And there, um, uh, I think I've even abstracted one, one step beyond that to say we don't need to actually resolve, be able to simulate a stream in those things, in those different models for dark matter right now. But we can just try to constrain the bulk properties of the subhalos that we see, and then ask, can a different, a given dark matter model produce a subhalo like that? So I think that's one possible avenue is to take a more agnostic approach and see what we can learn, and then see how that imprints on the effective models that we have for dark matter. What was your first question now? The first question was, you were mentioning these compressed dark matter ah, yes. representations. Yes. What, what do you want? With yeah, yeah. Like, 
Uh, good, yeah. So what, what I want is like a subset of the particles from dark matter simulations at a bunch of different time steps. And to, to zeroth order, the thing I could imagine doing is constructing a basis function expansion representation, like a low order expansion of the, the density distribution, and then try to somehow connect the, that, the expansion coefficients over the different snapshots that you have. Because the evolution of those different expansion coefficients at the, the low order end will tell us about the bulk, large scale evolution and changes to the dark matter halo. So that's specifically what I want from people who have access to simulations. I'm looking at a few people right now. Uh, but I, it's, a, it's a new direction. It's something that I don't exactly, I don't know what to do if I were to sit down in my laptop right now and, and work on it. So you showed this example, so you had some, some streams and uh, there was an anomaly in the, the velocities and you found uh, an object that matched that, the, the LMC. Do you have any examples <coughs> of uh, other anomalies that <coughs> don't have an, a known object? <laughs> because I guess you would have said so if you had it, but... Uh... Well, actually we do. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I put in images of them. Yeah, so there's a few... Okay, wait, no, I can... This is going to require you to put on your astronomer goggles, though. <laughs> it's going to require some squinting. So believe me when I say that right here, there's a sort of bluish hue. Mm -hmm. Do you see a bluish hue right here? OK, good. All right. There's a stream there called Jhelum. It's named after a uh, river in India. And Jhelum is really weird because it looks like it's a thin stream. You can actually see there's kind of a ridge line here. But if you use prop, it's close enough that we, can, we have Gaia data for this stream. And if you make a filtered map of, of the stream, it has a thin component and then a really bizarre wide component around it as well. But it has a total mass that's typical of a globular cluster. So we have no explanation for that. It, that, it could be something very, very complex, or it could be maybe the, the globular cluster was inside of a dwarf galaxy and they both merged, and now we're seeing a really complex distribution of stars. But we don't know. But there's, there's other streams like that where we don't have an explanation. Actually, sorry. One, one of the most famous examples is this one, Sagittarius, which is the most, it's the stream that you find when you're, you're trying to find other streams. You accidentally find Sagittarius. And the reason it's, it's unexplained right now is there's this bright component that you can trace here. And then almost parallel to that, there's a fainter component that runs above the, the, the bright part of the stream. And so there's a lot of different things you could come up with to, to try to explain this. Like, Maybe it was rotation in the, the dwarf. The problem is we don't see rotation in the thing that's left over, and we don't see lots of like uh, signatures of rotation in the, in the tails. Maybe it was two dwarf galaxies that fell in together, and they, one of them disrupted and formed this stream, and the other disrupted and formed that stream. Sometimes you mean wrapping all the way around, and you see twice that way. Or... No, because these are at the same distance, so it's it's very strange. So I think Sagittarius, which is the the really the thing that you, you, you can't not find uh, is, is one of the most unexplained streams. Sorry to interrupt you. So if you were to, this gets in the, to the program of figuring out uh, what came in and, and how long did it survive. Um, if you look at the fraction of stars in streams yes. that have identified the streams yeah. as a function of galactocentric radius, mm -hmm. what does that look like? I have not made that because I ex that, that plot. I, I expect the, the selection function to really imprint I mean, on The that. selection function is a big effect on it. Yeah. But my sense is that the, um, the fractions much well, the fraction mm. ought to be much higher at large galactic yeah. radius. Yeah, right. Because yes. the disruption mechanisms mm -hmm. are important to small galactic mm -hmm. radius. And I think you could probably write down something almost like a continuity equation if you assume that we're not at a very special moment and natural and clouds are coming in or something special. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that since things are going to be coming in, they're going to be destroyed as they come in, that even without knowing the destruction mechanisms, the radial dependence, once you deconvolve the observational selections, which I think yeah. are not trivial, but yeah. are not trivial, yeah. um, might give you a handle on this. <clears throat> That's fair. Um, I, you still don't need to know something about how density, the densities of streams evolve with time, like how they fade out of your, your selection in a sense, right? So if the, the dominant things that are causing streams to diffuse are, are different at small galactocentric radii versus large, you need to be able to resolve that, right? Yeah, but I, I think so. you could model the radial dependence 
yeah, of, the of the diffusion. Better than you know there. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So uh, I guess bionic effects can change things for that one is other structure. Wait, say, say the first uh, word. So bionic thinking oh, yes, bionic yeah, yeah. effects mm -hmm. and, and if you have in, in your idea of uh, this uh, halo model, if you're thinking or do you mind incorporating bionic effects uh, in some way? In the halo? Uh, I mean, when you were uh, uh, referring to uh, using uh, cosmodica simulations, oh, yeah. like Armada, uh, Well, yes, but I personally I would rather do that after you simulate it. So I'm happy to take different simulations that have different prescriptions and then see what those different things then lead to down the pipeline. <coughs> but I, yeah, I don't think like I don't think we need to include feedback as a tunable thing in our simulations and streams, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, but I guess you could build similar uh, models out of like a bunch of different simulations. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <coughs> oh, sorry.